Okay, you can turn in your Bible to the book of Matthew, chapter 12. I'm going to talk today about why Trinitarians can't understand the Godhead. Because I've seen this thing with people, and they say, I just don't understand how you can, you know, I don't, I don't get it. How could it be this thing of, you know, how, can, how could Jesus be on the earth praying to the Father in heaven? And he's, you know, not my will, but thine be done, and all this stuff. If they're one and the same, how does that even work? How, how could this happen? How could this work? Well, there's a reason that they don't understand that. Because, you see, uh, unless they're brand new and just kind of deceived by the thing, brand new, saved, and whatever else, uh, most of these Trinitarians are lost. They have not experienced a supernatural rebirth, the new birth that's there for a Christian. They don't know anything about it. And that's why they can't understand the concept of the biblical Godhead. I'm going to show you some scriptures on this today. It's going to be an interesting study. Matthew chapter 12, verse 18. Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. Now, I've been saying this for a long time, these different studies. We are made in the likeness of God. God has three parts to him. Body, soul, spirit. You just saw it right there. Uh, verse 18, my, In whom, behold, my servant, Jesus, whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul, there's the Father, is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him, the Holy Ghost, in other words, the Holy Spirit. He's also called that. So there you have the three. The servant is Jesus Christ. Jesus took upon him the form of a servant when he comes to the earth. There's the body, in whom my soul there's the Father, is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, the Holy Spirit. Man is made in that same image. We'll see about that here in just a little bit. Okay? And then you say, well, when does this happen? We'll go to Luke chapter 3. That's an Old Testament prophecy that we read there in Matthew chapter 12, verse 18. But here it actually is fulfilled. Luke chapter 3, verse 21 and 22. It says here, Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove, not as a dove, but like a dove, upon him. And a voice came from heaven, which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in, whom, in thee I am well pleased. What we just read in Matthew chapter 12, verse 18. My servant, Jesus, in whom my soul is well pleased. We just read here in verse 22. Thou art my beloved son, in thee I am well pleased. It's the soul that's well pleased. All right? And I'll put my spirit upon him. A bodily shape, the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. See how it ties in perfectly? Jesus is the servant. He comes and he's baptized of John. And what did John say to him too, by the way? It's not here in this passage. It's in another one of the passages. But John comes and he says, you know, I have need to, to be baptized of you. You know, he's, he's, and Jesus is saying, no, you know, baptize me. He's there as a servant, you see. He's the servant that God has chosen. You know, it's an amazing thing. So again, you're seeing right here how the Godhead works. Jesus is the body. He's the servant. The soul is the Father. He's pleased with the Son, you see. And the Spirit comes upon Him. Right there you go. Matthew chapter 26. Go back to the book of Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26, verse 36 through 46. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Look at, look at verse 38. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. Who's the soul? What did we read earlier? Matthew chapter 12, verse 18. Luke chapter 3, verse 21 and 22. The soul is who he's well pleased with the son there. He's well pleased with the servant. It's the father. So here he's saying, my soul is exceeding sorrowful. 
the father is exceeding sorrowful. I mean, I have a little boy, and uh, if I was looking and saying my son is going to have to die for a bunch of wicked people, I was looking at seeing my son being executed, uh, I think I'd be a little bit sorrowful, you know, just just a little. I mean, it would just it just tear my heart out. I, I I couldn't even imagine looking and seeing my son, knowing hey, my son's going to be being executed here soon. Talk about exceeding sorrowful. Yeah, definitely. Verse 39, And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep and saith unto Peter, What, could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Hmm. Now you can say that he was saying that about Peter and the other disciples. They kept falling asleep and, and whatever. But I think in, it's a, somewhat of a reference to himself. Okay. How does this thing work out? Well, here's what I believe. The soul is sorrowful. It's a father looking and saying, my son's going to get tortured to death here pretty soon. He's going to have to die for the sins of the world. He's going to, he's going to become sin. It's going to be a terrible thing. Sorrow. Jesus Christ, as the body, is looking and he's weak. He's thinking to himself, this is going to hurt a lot. He knows what's coming. He knows what's going to happen. I mean, I cannot fathom being whipped and beaten and things, and then they're spitting in your face and they're ripping his beard hair out, you know, grabbing fistfuls of it and, and ripping it and smacking him in the face and things, and, and then crown of thorns jammed onto his head, and then, and then they take him up and they, they nail him to a cross and he has to die slow a slow death. Uh, yeah, that'd be kind of rough. That'd be very rough. All right, but look at this. The spirit is willing. Well, what's the spirit's part in this whole thing? Well, the spirit knows that the spirit has an understanding of what this means, what this is going to mean. You know, the father's saying, "Oh boy, I'm just oh, I cannot believe it. Oh, this is it's a sorrowful thing." The flesh, Jesus Christ, is saying. Oh, Lord, if there's some other way, this is going to really, really hurt. This is going to be horrible pain that I'm going to have to go through. And the Spirit's saying, but what about the people that need to be saved, that have no other way of getting to heaven? Think of the glory. Think of the eternity with the people that accept you, that accept your death, burial, and resurrection. All three parts working together. Let me get back to that in just a little bit here. How as we as Christians, this is not just some kind of a thing, kicking the Trinity thing again. Uh, there's a challenge here for us as Christians because there's a difference there. When you're born again, I'll just kind of spoil the surprise here a little bit. When you're born again, you will feel the, the difference between spirit and flesh. You will know in your mind there are things that you shouldn't be doing and your flesh is going to say, let's do it anyways. Jesus Christ was sinless. We're not sinless. We still have that temptation to sin. We still have those things that, that are always there. We'll get more into that more later here, but let's continue. Verse 42. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Okay, uh, watch out for a false teaching out there that says that you can't pray the same words. Okay, when Jesus talks about vain repetitions, praying with vain repetitions as the heathen do, he's not talking about, God, please save my mother, or God, please save my brother, or something. And every day you wake up, Lord, I just pray, save my brother. And you just keep praying the same thing. That's not vain words. Vain words is, Hail Mary, full of grace, blessed be the fruit of the womb, and the, you know, repeated prayers. See if I have one. Yep, right there. My Sunday Missal. There you go. This is vain repetitions of heathen people. All right. 
There's another one right there. Kind of dusty. I just kind of... The Order of Malta. The Knights of Malta. Catholic Book of Prayers. <laughs> i got all kinds of interesting things in my collection. But that's the stuff that Jesus Christ was rebuking. Not praying for the same person over and over again or the same request. Okay, so... I just wanted to say that. Verse 45. Then cometh he to his disciples and saith unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. All right. So, is there a struggle there? Is it just, okay, he's God and he doesn't even think about anything and whatever? No. What's the difference there between Jesus and the Father and the Spirit? What's the difference? Jesus feels pain. The soul, the Father, he doesn't feel physical pain. He feels emotional pain. And the Spirit says, you know, when the Spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Holy man of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Not quoting that exactly right, but it's the Holy Spirit that inspires these scriptures. The Spirit of Truth. He's kind of the, uh, uh, I don't want to say impersonal spirit there that's there that, that just says, well, you know, it's not really a matter of emotion or, or physical pain. It's just what I've written. It's just right there. There you go. And that's good. You need that. Uh, when you're lost, you don't understand a lot of things because they're spiritually discerned. You can't understand absolute truth. It's always amazing to me. I've seen some lost people that really have a lot of things figured out, but they'll just be so off in one area or two areas or a couple areas. And that, you know, I've seen doctors that are like this, you know, nutritional doctors. I don't pay attention to the medical establishment guys. They're just drug pushers for the pharmaceutical industry, but another story. But I've seen some natural doctors out there and they're so good in so many areas and just one or two spots, they're just totally wrong. I mean, just you're going, how can't you figure this out? This is just totally, you know, wrong. They don't have the spirit of truth in them. They can find a lot of truth, but they can't find it all because they don't have the Holy Spirit to guide them into all truth. But see, what about us as a Christian? We have a body. Can this body feel pain? Yes. Uh, if you've been saved for any amount of time, I mean, well, if you're just a regular person, whatever, you know that your body can feel pain. What about your soul as a Christian? Do you ever get in arguments between your flesh and your soul? Up here, your mind, you know something's wrong. We're going to get into this more as we continue here, but uh, you're going to see that. And the Holy Spirit of truth is going to be there to say, that's what the Bible says. That's what the truth is. Submit to it. And your soul is going to say, yeah, you really need to do that. And your flesh is going to say, I don't want to do it. But you see, it's not the same thing. It's similar, but not the same thing with the Godhead because Jesus Christ couldn't sin. So he isn't tempted to sin as, as far as he's not falling for sin all the time and whatever else, like we mess up. It wasn't like that. But there's weakness there. There's, you know, I mean, he, he got tired sometimes. Fell asleep. Well, let's continue. Romans chapter 7. Now we're going to look at the Christian, how the Christian... How there's this struggle between the uh, flesh and your spirit. Romans chapter 7, verse 14 through 25. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. This is not past tense Paul's talking about back before he got saved. That's stupid nonsense. A bunch of work salvationist people out there, namely within the street preaching movement, the street papist movement. There are street preachers that are saved and that you know, that are born again, and they know that they're not out there trying to preach sinless perfection. Uh, that's a papal thing. I saw some Catholic wrote a comment. It's funny. He said, uh, we do, you know, you just say that we're all work salvation, but we, yet we do believe in faith, you know, in, in Jesus and his, you know, sacrificial death on the cross. And, yeah, but you see, 
you don't truly believe in Jesus Christ. Anybody that says you have to do this or do that or do that or whatever else to keep yourself saved, all right, um, you're teaching works salvation. All right, just as simple as that. Uh, you can be sinlessly perfect in things. No, you can't. No, you can't. Not as a Christian. Nope, sorry. And you're going to see that with what Paul's writing here. Romans chapter 7, verse 15. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. Have you ever found yourself watching something stupid on YouTube that you know you shouldn't have watched? You were supposed to read the Bible or you're going to watch a video about the Bible or watch some kind of preaching thing and instead you wasted your time watching something stupid online, online and you come away feeling vexed. You click on some video and... and in the back of your mind, you hear that still small voice as a Christian saying, don't watch this, don't watch that, don't watch it. Oh, I'll be all right, I just got to, you know, I'm researching, you know, or something. Next thing you know, you're watching it, and it's not some kind of pornography or some kind of rock concert or whatever, but you're watching this, and all of a sudden, somebody just starts letting the profanity fly, and you go, oh, oh. I can't tell you how many times I've done that. It's a struggle. It's a real struggle. There's been many times I know I'm supposed to be doing something for the Lord and the old flesh gets in there. Uh, you know, the Bible says much study is a weariness to the flesh. Uh, yeah, that's absolutely true. I've had times where I need to get something done. i got to write a sermon or whatever else. And I'm writing it and I'm just, I'm getting tired and, uh, uh, you know, whatever. And uh, I end up falling asleep or some kind of thing like that. There's a war there. We'll see about that as we continue. Verse 16. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Hmm. Interesting. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. You can't really clean your flesh up to the point of being sinlessly perfect. All right. Uh, when I teach and preach the new birth and a changed life that follows salvation, but I've never once taught uh, sinless perfection, the changed life is you're going to see some things change. And now when you sin, when you mess up, and you will mess up, and you will sin, you will feel vexed about it. And as time goes by, the Lord's going to make that your wide world of activities and other things, He's going to make it smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, where all of a sudden you're not hanging out with the people you once did, you're not going out and doing the things you used to do and not listening to the kind of stuff or dressing a certain way or talking certain ways. It gets smaller, you see. Why? Because Jesus Christ is trying to get you to focus on Him. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in His wonderful face, and the things of earth will go, grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Like the old hymn says, when you turn your eyes upon Jesus and you look into His wonderful face, everything out there, all the world, all that the world has to offer just goes whoop, and just gets real small. And you cross off this, I can't do that anymore. I don't feel right doing this anymore. I don't, you know, that's what happens when you get saved. But you're still going to sin. You're still going to struggle with sin. you got to understand that. Don't get rough on yourself and say, well, I, I sinned the other day, so I don't think I really got saved, or I probably lost it and things. It's so funny because these, these uh, street papists that teach the whole thing of work salvation, and that, uh, you know, you're sinless or something and whatever and you can backslide and you can fall away and all this other stuff every single one of them believes that they can get it back and yet show me someone anybody in scripture that lost it and got it back lost their salvation and then got it back and then loses it again and they get it back then lose it again and then they get it back <laughs> they'll turn you to verses of scriptures and like particularly in the book of hebrews where it's talking about a saint in the time of jacob's trouble they'll turn you there and they'll say, see, you can lose your salvation. Yeah, but in context, it says you can't get it back. But they just kind of forget that part. So, I can say a lot more on that, but we'll continue. Uh, verse 18. 
For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Again, from just a fleshly perspective. Uh, you can't fix up your flesh with your flesh without the Holy Spirit helping you. In other words, for the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that with, when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Check that out. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I'll just finish here and I'll come back to that. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Part of the thing of when you become redeemed is God will fix up some things up here in your mind. They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Mark chapter 2 verse 17 talks about that. When you realize I'm sick, I can't, there's no more self-righteousness here. I can't save myself. All right? That's called repentance. I can't put trust in myself anymore. I have to put my faith in Jesus Christ. I'm no good, I'm rotten, I'm sick. You see, I want to change life. I need help. Obviously, if you go to the doctor because you found a big tumor someplace on you, you want a changed life. That's why you're going to the physician. You go in there and you say, Doctor, do I have cancer? And he takes a few tests. Yeah, it's definitely cancer. Okay, thank you for letting me know. See ya. Um, no, you're going to go in there and you're going to say, well, what can we do about it? Well, nothing really. You just, you know, now that you've been diagnosed with cancer, you can just, you know, believe that you have cancer and and uh, believe that there is a cure and you just go on and do your thing. No, you're going to say, um, whatever the cure is, I, I want to be cured. You see. <laughs> but... Uh, Verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And again, look at uh, verse 23. I see another law in my members. What's the members there? The body of this death, this fleshly body. I mean, you can go and you can get the cure for cancer. Speaking spiritually here, you can go and you can get saved. You can get your sins forgiven. But guess what? You get cured of cancer, you can still get cancer later on in your life. Even if you do it the right way through nutritional therapy and whatever else, if you mess around, you get in the wrong environments, get around a lot of the high-frequency radio type of stuff and whatever, like a lot of the cell phones do, um, you'd still get cancer. It just, you know, well, I've been cured of cancer, so I can just go live in however I want and I won't never get cancer again. Uh, you can still get cancer after you've been cured of it. And it's the same thing with sin. You mess up your life as a lost person and you can make a wreck of your life and you get saved and then you never have to worry and you can just go on out and do whatever you want. No, no, that's not what the Bible teaches. All right? You get saved, some, some things change, but you can still get messed up in sin. That's what's going on here in Romans chapter 7. But notice it says there, uh, I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind. What's the mind? Well, when you're saved and the Holy Ghost comes in, the Holy Spirit of truth comes in, He'll guide you into all truth. And now your soul is oftentimes related to the mind. And the Lord will put things into your mind and He'll say, don't do that. Don't watch that. Don't eat that. Don't listen to that. Don't dress that way. Don't." Do He'll start to tell you. And you're going to have that fight there. You're going to feel that as a Christian. You say, what's this have to do with the Godhead versus Trinity thing? Well, again, Trinitarians look and they say, how could Jesus be talking with himself? Well, if you've experienced a new birth, you would be able to answer that very quickly. Because those of us that have experienced a new birth, you're going to talk with yourself a lot. Okay? That's what Paul's doing here. So it's crazy. What do you think Paul's doing right here in this passage? You're going to have those arguments. I remember when I first got saved, I was still struggling with pornography. And I think part of it was because I was going to a, a Babel building back then. And Babel buildings are just pagan temples. They're phallic temples, but that's another issue. 
and I'm struggling with the thing and, 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 you know, there were times when it would be, I'd be tempted, I'd be just filled with lust, wanting to look at pornography and things. And, and, and in my mind, I'm going, don't you dare. You're going to give an account for that. You're going to answer for that. God's not going to let that go unpunished. He's going to chasten you for that thing. You can't look at this stuff. And my flesh is going, but I want to look at this stuff. I just, just a little bit. It's a little bit. It's not going to hurt. We're not going to make this a, a, a permanent thing. that's always going to be there. Just, just, just one time. It's just, just a few, you know, what? Mm-hmm. And I mean, there were times I was arguing and, and crying out to God and yelling and things. Uh, you're going to have the struggle there. All right? That's going to be there. You're going to do sometimes. I mean, there, there have been times I've given myself into sin, just, just something stupid. I know it's wrong. And I just go and I'm, I'm you know, junk food. I'm big into natural health and things. And one time uh, last year, uh, I went to the store and I was really hungry and I just thought, I'm just going to get some junk food. Well, it's got corn syrup in it and it's got food coloring in it and it's got this and it's got that. And you know that stuff's wrong. You know that stuff's bad for your health. You know that you've detoxed from all that stuff. Yeah, I don't care. I'm just going to get it, you know. In my mind, I'm going, what are you doing? This is really stupid. My flesh is going, oh, you know, just uh, we haven't had it in so long. It's not going to hurt you. A little bit's not going to hurt you. Come on, just, just go. And, you... and what happened? Well, I got sick for two days from eating that junk. Threw a lot of it out, you know, a lot of the remainder of the stuff out. Stupid. Stupid. I knew better. My mind was arguing with my flesh. And there are times that you'll get up and you'll just say, Oh, you know, oh, wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? See, that's the struggle that we have as Christians. You're going to have those struggles. You're going to do those dumb things and your mind inside you're going, what are you doing? You know better than this. You know? But Jesus Christ didn't have the struggle as far as being tempted to sin. He wasn't going, oh, just, you know, kind of... There wasn't anything like that with Jesus Christ. But what Jesus was feeling is, he was feeling... The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 53, he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He had depression problems. I mean, he's going around, he can, he can read people's thoughts. Can you imagine how vexing that would have been for God manifest in the flesh, walk among his creatures and things, and, and to smell the smells and to hear the sights? And, to, and there's a child right there that's going to be abused and has been abused for years. And there's a guy who's cheating on his wife. And here's a woman there, she's backstabbed, you know, people, gossip and whatever else. And he's walking among that all the time. You know what he felt? He felt depression. He felt sorrow. I mean, I'm sure the Lord smiled, you know, different times and whatever, but the Bible really doesn't record him laughing much and, and really having a good time when he was here on the earth. I bet you it was a very vexing experience for him. And the closer you get to the Lord, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, Philippians chapter 4, being made conformable unto his death. Yeah. You're going to have that. You're going to understand that. As you grow as a Christian. It's exciting. It's neat and everything else when you first get saved. But boy, you start to get into the book and all of a sudden you start to see family and friends turn against you. You start to see things that you used to enjoy. You can't do that stuff anymore. There's just no enjoyment there. It's not some kind of a hard, fast, boom, rules that you cannot do it and you're just forced and you're shackled in or whatever. That's not the real thing there. You just can't get any enjoyment out of it. You know, I remember watching Hollywood movies after I got saved, and, and I thought that they were great movies back before I was saved, before I was born again, and, and uh, I enjoyed them. Back then, watching them as a saved man, I couldn't even get through the thing. I just shot it off. Hated it. Things change. But let's continue here. Romans chapter 8, go to the next chapter, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. We're going to see the contrast between the two here. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. 
For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. He condemned it because he lived sinlessly perfect. And see, when you come to the Lord as a sinner, his perfect life, you say, well, nobody's perfect. <laughs> Jesus was. You say, well, then the street preachers, they're, they're sinlessly perfect too. Are you kidding me? I mean, I could point those guys, I could point to so many different things. Pride, you know, contention, strife. Those are all lusts of the flesh. And they feed off of that, you see. Those guys are so covered in sin, it's just ridiculous. Jesus Christ is the only sinless man. And he condemned sin in his flesh. That's the whole thing. He died for your sins. Why? Because your death, your life, means nothing to God. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, the Bible says. Your good deeds, and I've done some good things for people. God doesn't think so. God's not impressed by anybody down here on this earth. Nobody can claim to be sinless. Only Jesus Christ. Continue, verse 4. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Talking about saved people there. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually, spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Obviously talking about lost people there. But look at verse 9. But, if ye, are, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of, Christ, Spirit of God dwell in you. Excuse me. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ... He is none of His. Interesting there because it says Spirit of God and then Spirit of Christ. It's the same Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. You say, well, see, this is just saying... Christians, as Christians, we are redeemed, we walk in holiness, and therefore we don't sin anymore, right? No. Keep reading. Verse 13. For if ye live after the flesh, ye, save people, that's what the context is, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. You know that if you're saved. You know it. You keep looking at pornography, it's going to have to get more and more and more perverse until finally you're looking at child pornography or something. I remember there was a police officer down in Pennsylvania when I used to live there, and they called him, uh, his computer, they found out that he was looking at child pornography, and they were going to arrest the guy, and it was going to be his big investigation and everything. He blew his brains out. He lived after the flesh, and he died. I knew a guy, neighbor, old neighbor, he was a drunkard. Drunken Roman Catholic. Uh, I tried to witness to him the one time and he cussed me out. Said he'll never believe what I believe. Whatever. And uh, he just drink, just drunk all the time. A couple years that I knew him, I only, I think probably less than five times he was ever sober when I went and talked to him. Um, I had to wait all, for years to find him sober enough that I could actually witness to the guy. Most of the other times he was inebriated. Drunk, in other words, if you don't know what that means. Um, what happened? Oh, you know, he died. Drunk, fell over, you know, drowned in his own vomit. I've known other drunks that die of cirrhosis of the liver. The guy that smokes cigarettes gets lung cancer, emphysema, whatever. Um, you, any sin, any sin is destructive. And as a Christian, if you fall back into those sins, verse 13 there, if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. If you give in to your flesh, it's going to kill you. Especially because you're more accountable now. God's going to chasten you. And there again, I've known of Christians that they get to messing around with the flesh and whatever else. God will take you home sometimes. See, I don't believe that. I just don't believe that. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 
Verse 28. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. You're supposed to remember what Jesus Christ did on the cross, how he paid for your sins. Why? So that you don't mess around with those sins. I mean, you came to him sorry for doing those sins. What on earth are you doing going back to him? should bring some conviction into your life. Look what happens. Verse 30. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. They get to mess around with the sins of the flesh. And God finally has to say, okay, boom, kills them. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Look at this, verse 32. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Can you sin as a Christian? Absolutely. You're not going to lose your salvation. Why? Because it's not your salvation. If you're genuinely saved, it's His salvation. He saves you. You don't save yourself with your belief or your confessions or your whatevers. You pray and you ask God to save you. You don't pray a little scripted prayer and say, okay, I did that, so I'm saved. No, you're calling upon the name of the Lord and saying, God, please save me. And the answer that comes back is, you become born again. And all of a sudden, things start to change. That's the supernatural rebirth, being born again, in other words. But let's continue here. Galatians chapter 5. Again, you know, the, the whole point of this little study I'm doing here is, why can't these Trinitarians, why can't they understand this? Well, in my experience, a lot of them have never experienced the new birth. They don't know what it's like to be born again. So they don't understand that conflict between the flesh and the soul and the spirit of truth there to guide you into all truth. They don't understand that. They read books that Christian men have written, like a lot of this stuff back under here. A lot of the stuff that's down here, they read this as a way to interpret that. They don't dare try to interpret this on their own because that could lead to heresy. You know, <laughs> Catholicism. Excuse me. That's what the Catholic Church teaches is what I mean. They'll read all these books down here, you see? And that makes them think that they're saved. That they have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and therefore understand His Word. They don't have anything of the kind. They've never experienced a new birth. They're not born again. And so when you try to explain to them how the Godhead works, how you have Jesus as the body, and He is praying to the Father in heaven as the soul. And there's a difference there. So it's not modalism. Modalism is, you know, people come up with all these little words and things and all this little stuff. These modalist things, they, they believe that uh, God is one in, and He just can manifest Himself in three modes. But He can never be two parts of the Godhead separately there. Well, that runs into all kinds of problems because you read there in the book of Revelation and other places, you have, you know, the Father sitting on the throne and the Son at His right hand over here. And why? Well, because there's prophecies that need to be fulfilled and then they become one in eternity. All right? See, God, the, God I'll say it this way, God can, can do something that other people can't do. All right? He can split Himself off and work independently. The body can be separate from the soul and the spirit. We can't do that, at least not knowingly. You know, uh, Paul, he gets stoned to death at one point in time, and he gets called up to heaven. His soul goes up. But the, the early Christians were standing there looking at his dead body. They carried outside of Jerusalem, you see. They're looking at the body, but the soul's in heaven. So, but let's continue. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 through 26. This I say, then walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. What we've been reading about over in Romans chapter 7 and Romans chapter 8. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Okay? Again, you're to be led of the Spirit. You're not under the law, 
right? You don't have to follow the Ten Commandments or keep the commandments to stay saved or something like this. The commandments are there as a schoolmaster to point you to the fact that you are a sinner and you can't save yourself. And you need Jesus Christ as your perfect Savior. That's the purpose of the law. And when you get saved, you're no longer under the law. Now you're led of the Spirit. You say, well, then you don't sin, right? Verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You say, well, let's see, that's for lost people. Uh, no, it isn't. Keep your hand there in Galatians chapter 5 and go over to Romans chapter 14. This list is not for lost people. Lost people don't inherit the kingdom of God. You know why? Let's look here. Romans chapter 14, verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. The kingdom of God is spiritual fellowship. That's what's going on there. It can also refer to the future millennial kingdom. But again, the future millennial kingdom and spiritual fellowship with God are not things that lost people have. Go back to Galatians chapter 5. You say, well, then that list there, verses 19 through 21, that's for saved people? Saved people could get into that stuff? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And you say, well, that just doesn't make any sense. Oh, I can't believe in this stuff. Well, then you're working your way to heaven. And you're quite foolish. You say, well, then that's just not fair. How is that fair? How is it fair that Christians could get messed up in this stuff? See, again, the way that lost people think of this stuff, it's not about fair and unfair and whatever. It's not, it's not, these things are not some kind of a positive thing, right? A Christian that gets messed up in this stuff here, it's putting them out of fellowship with the Lord, which is what the passage is about. They don't inherit the kingdom of God. If you want to make that spiritual fellowship in this life or even millennial inheritance in the future, either one would work. But it's more than that, you see. It's not just that you're out of fellowship with God. You're also messing your life up. You're also destroying your life by messing around with the works of the flesh. By giving in to the flesh, you see. So it's not about, what's well, not fair. You know, I mean, if I took a hammer and just started smacking my hand and somebody would say, that's not fair, he shouldn't be allowed to do that. I'm only hurting myself. And a Christian that messes around in sin, they're only hurting themselves. Verse 22, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Alright? They say, well, there says crucified the flesh. Sure. But that does, that, does that mean that you're now sinlessly perfect? No. I mean, if you can live without sin down here, if you can somehow be sinlessly perfect, then there really was no point in Jesus coming and dying on the cross. You could just work your own way to heaven. It's crazy. But uh, there's a whole lot more I could say about that. But I just wanted to do this little study here quickly. Um, just to, as a, another way, why Trinitarians cannot understand the thing of the Godhead they can't understand. How could, Jesus, how could Jesus say that He's here on the earth and He's praying to the Father if He is the Father? How does that work? Uh, well, if you were saved, you would understand the fact that, yes, your flesh and your soul will talk back and forth sometimes. And the Holy Spirit of truth will be there to guide you into the truth. You know? It's kind of funny because the Bible says, In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Kind of weird. Because... You have three parts to you. God has three parts to Him. We're made in His image, you see. But with us, as men, we're not sinless like the Lord Jesus Christ was, as the body and God the Father is the soul and the Holy Ghost is the Spirit. We're not like that. We have our sinful body is tempted. It's prone to sin. And therefore, you have to crucify that flesh. You have to say, okay, you're not doing that. Put that down. Turn that off. Don't drink that. Don't eat that. It's crucifying the flesh. All right. 
But it's interesting because the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. There's going to be times your flesh is going to say, hey, you know what? I'd like to go do whatever. And your mind is going to say, no, don't do that. Why not? And your mind will say, uh, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Um, the stuff that you want to go do there falls into that category. You know? And the soul is saying, no. And the spirit is saying, the Bible says no. The mouth of two witnesses there and you bring that flesh in the line you crucify the flesh and you say yeah that's what the Bible says <laughs> you know when you study the Bible and you look at the Godhead you can understand it because you know as a Bible Bible believing Christian that's born again you can look and you can say you know what um, I get that I can understand how the body could talk with the soul. You know why? Because you do it all the time as a Christian. You understand the struggle between the two. You could understand, I mean, in, in a very, very finite way, I can understand the struggle that Jesus Christ would have had with the Father, the soul there, and the Holy Ghost as the Spirit. I can understand that. Jesus is saying, hey, you're not going to feel the pain that I'm going to be feeling soon as I die on that cross. And the Lord, the Father, is saying, I know. I feel the sorrow of that. You ever, you ever, you know, this is another thing. I mean, you ever see a Christian testimony or something like that and it brings tears to your eyes? You hear about people suffering or about some kind of thing, some Christian brother or sister in Christ that's suffering, going through some, and you weep for them? You know why? It's the soul. You're feeling something there, that connection, that spiritual connection. You feel that as a Christian. There's a difference, you know. That's the whole thing I'm trying to get through in this study. There's a difference between the body of flesh and the soul, representing the mind many times, you'll, you'll see that, and the spirit of truth that helps you understand this book. There's a difference. And so if we can see that difference with our own lives as born-again Christians, uh, certainly there's going to be that difference there in the Godhead where Jesus can be kneeling down in anguish and saying, I don't want to go through this, but I, and the Spirit says, but you have to. I know I have to. And the soul says, it's just, I can't bear the thought of having to see you die down there on the cross. Yeah, and the flesh goes, yeah, I know it's going to really hurt. It's going to be really bad. And the Spirit says, the scriptures must be fulfilled. They're talking amongst themselves. And as a Christian, in a very, very small way, you're going to experience the same thing. You will experience it when you are tempted to sin. Your flesh is going to say, it's not a big deal. Come on. No big deal. And your soul is going to say, it is a big deal. Your flesh will say, why? And the Spirit will chime in and say, turn your Bible to... You know, yeah, you're going to feel it. And I'll put an even better one on you. How about the martyrs? If all of a sudden it becomes illegal to stand for this book to the point of death, the death penalty, and they bring back public execution, the Roman Catholics come to open control. They already have control of this country, let's face that, here in America. And most of the other countries out there as well. There's very few countries that aren't under Vatican control. I mean, if they're going, if the, if the president is going and bowing down before the Pope and kissing his ring and things, back in the Middle Ages, they people would look at that and they say, oh yeah, the, you know, our king is the servant of the Pope, obviously. Now people go, I don't know, I don't know. I mean, he went to visit with the Pope, but does that really prove anything? Well, you know, it proves that you don't understand history. <laughs> That's what that proves. But let's just say, Total, open, Vatican control before the catching away of the body of Christ. And all of a sudden, you realize they just put out a new list of heretics, obstinate heretics. 
and you check out the list and your name's on it. And they say, these obstinate heretics are to be rounded up within the next month and we'll be sending our inquisitors out to round up these obstinate heretics and they will be given a chance to recant and if they don't recant, they will be publicly executed by burning at the stake. What are you going to do? Do you think that there's going to be some struggle between the flesh and the soul and the spirit? Yeah. Do you think that you're going to be able to relate to Jesus Christ a little bit? Yeah. Absolutely. Your flesh is going to say, I don't want to be chained to a stake and have them put firewood around my feet, some kindling and things there, and watch them light that match and feel those flames coming up. And look down as my clothing is catching on fire and then feel that the pain of the flames on my skin. I don't want to do that. And your soul's going to be saying, I can't believe it's gotten to this point. You're going to feel some fear. And the Spirit's going to say, but the Bible says, you're going to compromise? You're going to give up your faith in what the Scriptures say? And your soul will say, no, I don't want to be ashamed for all of eternity for being a coward and recanting. And the flesh goes, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. I don't have a choice. See, if you're born again, you'll understand those things. You'll understand that struggle. You'll understand how Jesus, as the Son, could pray to the Father, the body, praying to the soul, and the Spirit coming along and saying, it's all right. It's written. You can have an assurance. God didn't leave us with oral traditions. Things that have been passed down by hearsay and conjecture and whatever. Written, authoritative scripture. So can I get that in writing? Sure. Absolutely. So I hope it's been a challenge to you. I know this little study was a challenge to me as I, as I did the research on that thing. Uh, another proof for the Godhead, the biblical Godhead, and against the pagan trinity, but uh, just as a challenge um, and a constant reminder of that struggle between the flesh and the soul and the spirit there. And there's a, there's that, that struggle supposed to be there, brethren. And if that struggle is not there, I can tell you right now, the flesh took over a long time ago. Um, the flesh will never keep quiet. The soul and the spirit will sometimes. You can quench the spirit. You can tell the Lord to be quiet. You can ignore what God is putting into your mind. The flesh, always going to be a struggle. You're always going to have to fight the flesh for the rest of your life. I pray that you take heed, not to my words, to the book. And let the Holy Spirit of truth guide you into all truth. That's going to be it. Thank you for watching.